Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Cloud Native TV uh, and the Search Magic Show. So, just before starting, um, this is an official live stream of CNCF, and as such, is subject to CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. So, basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, so, Cloud Native TV uh, runs amazing shows. So make sure you follow uh, the cloudnative.tv Twitch channel where you are seeing the live stream. And uh, this is the search magic show where we talk all about Kubernetes and related certifications. Uh, and this is the sixth episode uh, in the series. Until now, we have uh, you know covered a lot from the curriculum. Uh, you know from why certifications are important, uh, what are they, then uh, the uh, installation of the cluster using cryo, uh, then what are deployments, pods, objects, uh, different set of objects, then obviously the scheduling things, how you can schedule using node name, node selector, uh, taints and tolerations, services and ingress, how they work. And today we'll be talking about another uh, very interesting section from the certification, very big one uh, that plays a very important role in the exam as well, which is Kubernetes troubleshooting. And uh, obviously it plays, if you go by the curriculum, uh, so it, it is around 30% from the uh, the questions uh, that comes in the exam. So 30% is big chunk of the exam. And uh, so you should be knowing, you know, in and out of troubleshooting. And who better than uh, you are seeing on the screen can this, uh, you know, tell you about uh, troubleshooting. So uh, very glad that today I'm joined by my very, very, very good friend, um, David, uh, AKA Raw Code. Um, Obviously, if you know the cloud native ecosystem, cloud native world, CNCF about live streaming, then you have probably heard of uh, David and uh, his YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, there is very interesting series that um, you know uh, Raw Code does, uh, which obviously he'll explain much better. But uh, that has given uh, not only him but all of us as well uh, the great troubleshooting skills for Kubernetes. Uh, I have been on the show a couple of times, so I know like you know what it takes and how things go, how the flow goes, and actually it gives you the exam feeling when you are on the show uh, because you you have to you know kind of fix the clusters and they are broken, so you get to troubleshoot live and the same feeling you'll be you know having uh, when you are giving the exam when you'll be asked to troubleshoot something in your cluster. So, uh, David, welcome to the uh, stream. Welcome to CNCF uh, Search Magic Show on Cloud Native TV. Uh, I know you also run a show, so we already know everything. <laughs> but uh, w please introduce yourself and you know your show, the Clustered, uh, or to the community. All right. Well, thank you very much, Siam. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, I've already had to do some debugging and fix my name live. Uh, I keep forgetting that I changed my name recently. But uh, yeah, as Sam said, I'm, I'm David. You'll know me across the internet as, as Raw Code. I am CKA, CKAD, not yet CKS certified. And as Sam said, I have a show called Clustered, which is super, super good fun. Um, it's a show that will help you learn how to debug and troubleshoot the worst, worst problems in the Kubernetes space there is. Um, we're seeing some pretty wild breaks these days. I'm not going to spoil it, but... Feel free to go to rockcode.live and check out some of the episodes, and I hope you enjoy them. All right. Awesome. So what do we have today uh, for the for the community with respect to the troubleshooting that uh, they can, you know, learn quite a few things? Yeah, so we'll just kind of, you know, there's a few things here in the, in the curriculum document that we have shared on the screen. Um, just a few things that everyone really needs to be familiar with. I think it's important to highlight, and I'm sure Siam's covered this before on previous episodes, but you know, the CKA exam is about the administration and operability of a Kubernetes cluster rather than you know deploying and working with Kubernetes. So you really do need to know how to debug and understand all of the control plane components. And we're going to be taking a look at that today. So you can see from this list, which is not exhaustive, but it's quite, you know, it covers most of the things, is that we've got to be able to evaluate cluster and node logging. We want to understand how to monitor the applications. You definitely need to understand container logging. And my favorite parts, troubleshooting application failures, troubleshooting cluster component failures, and troubleshooting network. Um, these are things that really you can read all you want, but the best way to learn these things is to get hands-on, kick the tires, play with all the components, and fix some real-world issues. Uh, nothing like a Kubernetes cluster on fire to make you learn things a little bit quicker. And that's where we've we've 
we've got for today. Um, I've gone ahead and prepared two Kubernetes clusters. One of them is, is healthy, and Siam and I will go through it, take a look at all the components, have a bit of a conversation, and then we'll pull up the, the broken cluster, and we'll see if we can work through it issue by issue. Uh, feel free to throw your ideas into the chat if you want to guess along with us and help us fix it, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Does that sound Absolutely. all right to you, Sam? Yep, that sounds fun. Uh, also, uh, if you make the stream kind of interactive and uh, you know uh, you keep on suggesting some of your cool ideas on how to solve a particular issue that we are on, uh, then we also have two uh, coupon giveaways, which is a 50% off on your certification exams, which is a good deal. So make sure you are you know just uh, chatting and just uh, <laughs> making it interactive. So that's pretty much it. And we'll, in the end, just pick two winners randomly. All right. I love that first comment. It's got to be DNS. Uh, it's not DNS today, I can assure you. I broke the thing. I know. Although that doesn't mean that we won't encounter a real issue and DNS does cause problems, but let's hope not. All right. So as part of the, I, I'm using my actual cluster to automation for today. So we have access to our teleport session, which will allow me to connect to all of these nodes. And I'm just going to jump on to the control plane here. And so the control plane is where our API server, our scheduler, and a whole bunch of other things run. And we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail as we go. Now, one of the first things that everyone should do when they are operating a Kubernetes cluster is probably just type kube control version. Um, to see if your client and your server match up, like so. And what we'll see here is that we have a client version. Is that font okay for you, Sam, or do you want it bigger? Yeah, uh, I think uh, you can increase the font a bit. All right. Well, let me just reload the page so the scroll thing goes away. Okay, so okay, we've got our version here, and you can see our client is 122, but we did not get a version from the server. Now, I know the server is online. The thing that is missing is that we need a kube config. And we can do that through here. Now, there's a few assumptions here that are being made, but I think it's safe to say that these days, most people are working with kube admin clusters, which means that kube admin is going to provision you an admin.conf inside of the slash etc slash Kubernetes directory. And we can run our version again. And you'll see now that we actually get a client version and a server version back. All right, uh, something else you should probably be familiar with is you want to be able to check your current context like so, and you'll see that we don't have one. And that's just because we're relying on the kubeconfig flag right now, uh, and we can use an environment variable so that we don't have to duplicate that every single time. Cool. Yep, and uh, the cube config um, context is really plays a very important role uh, when you are in the certification exam because uh, different questions are uh, based in different contexts. So make sure you are always switching the con context before attempting a question. Yeah, great advice. So because we've exported our cube config environment variable, we now can run current context. And in fact, we could just run config view and we can see all the details of the clusters that we have access to. Important to remember that a cube config can have multiple clusters, users, etc., defined inside of it. Uh, and thank you. I, oh, that's, I think that's relatively new, the redacted here. Um, I don't remember seeing that before. That's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, what runs on our control plane nodes? Well, again, because this is a cube admin cluster, um, we can pretty much consistently rely on a kubelet running as a systemd service. Now, the reason that you can rely on this is one, the kubelet is responsible for asking a container runtime to run your containers. So it's unlikely that your kubelet itself will run inside of a container, although not impossible, of course. Uh, and because it's a kube admin cluster, what we're going to see is that um, all of our other control plane components are started by the kubelet via something called a static pod, which we'll talk about again in just a second. But one of the, like, if you're ever running into any problems on a Kubernetes cluster, system control status kubelet is your friend. You want to be able to make sure that it is active and running. You don't want to see this with um, any sort of restarts or an active line. That would typically be bad. Uh, and we can see we get some log information here. Um, the status command is not the best way to work with the logs in your cluster. 
you'll want to use journal control and then depending on who you ask in the technology world you're going to get 15,000 different options for what to use as flags but I'm a fan of using XE or flu thank you Fresbo I'll pull that back a little bit um, and we can see here that journal control dash flu will allow us to pull us out our logs from the kubelet now, this looks pretty healthy I'm not worried about any of the errors that we see here um, this is our healthy cluster so I'm pretty confident <coughs> okay so we have a kubelet through systemd but we don't really have anything else yet so what's next as part of our control plane well we can go to our xa kubernetes directory and you will see that we have a manifest directory here this manifest directory is really important this is where all of the static manifest live by static manifest, what we mean is something that the kubelet is going to be responsible for starting when it starts. Um, so you'll see all the other control plane components are here. We've got etcd, we've got the API server, we have the controller manager, and we have the scheduler, and I'm also running a kubefip here, which I need for bare metal ingress. Let's run. Now, the cube system namespace is where all of these static manifests will live. And we can see that everything here is running. Now, there's some little syntactic or weird things you'll see across the documentation and error messages, particularly if you start to look inside of the kubelet logs. When we refer to a static manifest, that is the YAML file that lives in the static manifest directory. And um, you may also hear something called of a mirror pod. So what the kubelet does is when it has a static manifest, it will actually log that with the API server as a mirror pod. So it's not a real pod, but it is a pod, but you still see those two words used um, back and forward. Okay, now if we <laughs> need to understand what is happening with our system, we need to be able to use the logs to debug problems. Uh, there's two really important directories that you should be familiar with. Barlog containers is my favorite. It's where all the active running container logs are. Um, so if you see a file in here, the chances are the container is actively running and you can tail any of these to see what is happening. Here is our API server log. Another important directory, especially for containers that are no longer running is the pods one. Um, so the pods directory will give you a pod name and then some identifiers and I don't know if we have any in here, but certainly we will see this in our broken cluster, but you'll have multiple IDs for the same pod name, particularly when they are stuck in a crash loop back off kind of pattern. Okay, we're going to look at a couple more tools before we dive over to the broken cluster. Now, I said earlier, uh, I guess it doesn't matter where I am in directory, but uh, I said earlier that the kubelet is responsible for asking the container runtime to start a pod or a container. So the kubelet does not start any containers at any point in time ever. It merely proxies a request to that runtime. The runtime that is primarily used these days, at least what I've seen, is container D. And container D ships with a few commands that are going to be invaluable in debugging any sort of broken Kubernetes cluster. The first one is CTR. So this is just a tool for uh, trying to understand what container D is doing or you know what assets it has available. Common command to run would be CTR images list. Now there's a few weird things to understand with using the CTR command is that it's not by default Kubernetes aware. You actually need to tell it that you want to read from the Kubernetes namespace. And this is not a namespace you should confuse with Kubernetes namespaces, which I know can get a little bit weird. Uh, but we can actually say Kate's uh, oh, K9s, Kate's.io images list, and these are all the images that it has pulled inside of this namespace for running inside of my cluster. Um, but this is something I see tripping people up often, and um, they run CTR images and they're like, "Oh, my cluster is running more images than this. Where are they?" And it's just that namespace toggle, um, and you can actually list the namespaces as well with CTR NSLS. Uh, now, CTR is a bit more low level. You may want to work with something that is slightly more aware of Kubernetes. And for that, we have cry control. 
you may, like most people, like try control PS and be worried that nothing is happening. And that's just because there is a little bit of configuration that is needed to get this command running. It just needs to know where your container D socket is. Depending on your operating system or Linux distribution of choice, the chances are it's going to live in var run container D, container D .soc. And from here, we can run a cry control PS to see a list of all of the, the things that we have running in our cluster. Cry control is pods aware, so you can run pods and also get another look at it from here too. So those are just some of the, con oh, that's all of the control plane components that we have available on the machine. Some tools for working with the containers and trying to work out what is actually happening and uh, the access to the logs and how to configure your cube control command. I believe that is everything that we're going to need to know to move into our broken cluster. Uh, Sam, is there anything you would like to talk about there before we move on? Yep. Uh, so the the cry control uh, and providing the runtime uh, endpoint is uh, very important, and I think you should just you know keep it handy somewhere. Just uh, you know, uh, just so you can directly copy paste it and you know uh, run that. And uh, there there was a question like you know um, why it is important to go to the file system rather than using the kubectl log. So uh, there might be times when when the Kubernetes kubectl will get pods, kubectl will get nodes itself won't work. So control plane is down and things like that. So for that, you have nowhere to debug. So general CTL logs uh, are, uh, you know, that they can give you the first level of information and then you can move to the file system, which is the uh, ETC manifest and uh, uh, the var log uh, kubelet. Uh, those are some of the, you know, kind of directories where you can see the containers, you can see what all things are happening. Obviously, there are a lot more uh, things, not a lot more nasty things that attacker can do uh, that, uh, that can be done. But generally, these would be some of the initial uh, places that you will be looking at and rightly said like kubelet is not something that would run the container so that is very important you should take care of that like kubelet is uh, sending the request to the container runtime and container runtime in uh, you know and in, in turn is running your containers and even in that if it's container d then container d itself do not run it's actually the run c behind it which actually runs the container so it's it's you know different levels which are there so that is also a kind of uh, a good to know uh, thing for for you yeah, definitely. I'll add one more thing to that, although Siam smashed it and nailed everything there. But uh, yeah, you may not have an API server and knowing where they live on disk is, is critical. Also, um, through the logs or kube control logs command, you can access the current logs or the previous logs, but you can't go back any further than that. So you may, again, if you want to go back a couple of pods or containers, uh, jump down to the file system to get them. So, always handy to know where they live. All right, we ready to fix one? Let's go. I'll just pretend you said yes. All right. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Just let me just do this. There we go. That's better. I was getting worried I broke teleport. Okay. So I'll zoom in one more. Refresh the page just to get rid of that bug. Okay. So we have a control plane, we hope, going to run version and we can see we got our client version but we don't have our server version so we know how to fix this right we're going to export our cube config you think this is going to work sam <laughs> let's see hopefully <laughs> uh, all right uh, so it, fa it still failed and um, we got an error message that the connection to our server. Now, what's really uh, important in these messages? The first one said localhost 8080. This is the default. This means that you don't have a cube config configured. This is an IP address and a port. That's an indicator that we, we do have some Kubernetes context, but we're not able to speak to the server. Um, so that means that something is, is definitely wrong here. Uh, Russ is asking if I was stuck to my own rules. You, I guarantee it. I did not use any Unicode breaks, eBPF, or any naughty things that I do not like. So, uh, so we need to fix our first message here. Uh, we'll give the audience 30 seconds. The, the, it's really easy. I'm going to leave that message there for, for 10 seconds. So, let's see. And have some water. 
Yep. So please post uh, the kind of next steps that you think uh, should be, you know, done uh, in the chat. Yeah. What'd you have for lunch today, Sam? Yeah, I had just. Uh, <laughs> I don't even remember what I had. That's that's the toughest question you can ask someone in the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Russ and there with the answer before anyone else. The port number is indeed incorrect. So you'll see this is looking for port 6334, and that is not our standard Kubernetes port. So we know that our kubeconfig is this admin.conf. My cursor nicely started exactly where I made the break. We fix the port number. We run version. And now we have something working. So that's a good start. Good catch, Russ. All right, Fat, you got a favorite command, Sam? What do you want to run next? Yeah, let's run kubectl get nodes. It worked. There we go. So things look good. Now, this is standard. <laughs> yeah, I just read your, your mind there, Sam. I'm going straight forward <laughs> with the pods. Um, this is, I'm going to play standard clustered rules today. So let me give you a bit of context before we move on. We have this, well, we're supposed to have a, a deployment called clustered with a pod called clustered showing up here. And we should be able to browse to it. And that is currently unavailable. We can also see that our API server is actually broken. And the reason I did this one, other than it just being funny, is that it kind of highlights that static pod manifest matter pod semantic and that it's not really a pod so right now this says container creating but we are creating the api server right so um, just be careful of that you can see that we don't have a scheduler and um, schedulers are not important i don't really care so we'll see if we need it um, but we want to get our application running okay so what's our next step here sam Put you on the spot. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's we can uh, go to the uh, journal CTL and see uh, what is happening with the kubelet and and stuff. Yes, we have a a lot of error messages here, and one particularly important one. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen that, but no, it's scrolling too fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we have a, another message that we have an admission controller denying all modifications to our cluster. And I, this is one of my favorite examples of something that we have to talk about when it comes to debugging and the Kubernetes API is that there are two different types of admission controllers. Most people are really familiar with dynamic admission controllers, which are validating webhook configurations and mutating webhook configurations. But the API server historically prior to dynamic mission controllers, did everything through built-in components that were compiled into the API server binary. So we've got that to fix. Uh, so we need to check out the static manifest for our API server. Where do those live against am? Yep, and the manifest folder. Oh dear. We don't have a manifest folder, am. What are we going to do? <laughs> uh, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just having some fun with this session. I hope you don't mind. But um, we need to, it's, it's important to understand how all these components are configured as well. So, the static manifest directory is consumed by the kubelet. So, we need to understand how the kubelet is configured. In fact, Russ was straight in there with the, the, the chat as well. So, uh, yeah, so we need to understand how that's configured. So, one of my favorite commands is to run a kube control cat on a service and it will show us all of the different drop-ins within system D that configure this service. The one that we are interested in is the kubelet configuration arguments, which we can see is a YAML file in var lib kubelet. So if we pop this open, we'll see that we can change the authentication and the authorization methods on our kubelet. We can change the cgroup driver, cluster DNS, cluster domain. And we've got a whole bunch of other stuff. And when we get down to the bottom, you'll see that we have the static pod path. Uh, I was just being cheeky and moved everything into root manifests. So we will, I guess I could just fix it there. So here are our manifest directory. 
I can't remember if I updated except no no I deleted them okay cool so we're going to work with this directory uh, now we've seen that we had an an admission controller which was denying all modifications to our cluster so we definitely need to fix that so if we want to modify the admission controllers we can come into the API server so this static manifest is very much like um the other one, we, well, it's kind of like the Kubernetes configuration. Now everything in Kubernetes is configured via YAML. And um, we can see that this is a pod manifest. We've got our commands. And the one that we are interested in is right here. So we have this enable admission plugins. And we can see that there is an always deny admission controller, which has no real purpose for anything in the world ever, 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 ever. Um, the reason it's here is just to really cause me a little bit of pain. So what monster changed that? I know, Russell. So we're going to remove it. We're going to save this. Now, when you make modifications to a static manifest directory or any of the YAMLs in there, the kubelet will automatically detect that change. And over the course of around 30 seconds, we'll remove the old container and start a new container. So I'm hoping if I timed this right, we won't see. Oh, no, I bet you it's going to be there. Ah, it's too slow because of my typo. We have seen a moment there where the API server just wasn't there. And now this one has just started. Okay, what's next? So now that we have fixed our API server, it now says running instead of container creating. We still have no scheduler, which is something we may have to look at. But not important right now. Um, so we want our clustered application. So oh, it's... It's not here. I'm not entirely sure why. Although we did run get deployments. We can see that the cluster deployment exists. It's got one of one up to date available. I mean, that looks pretty healthy, right? And if we run get replica sets, we have a replica set and that looks pretty healthy. So let's describe our replica set. Hmm. I don't see any error messages, Sam. I don't know what's going on. Anyone in the chat? You've got 30 seconds to drop in an idea of what could be potentially causing this situation. Russell, I may, I may have to ban you for answering. <laughs> You've been getting them all so far. All right, 10 more seconds. All right, nobody. Okay, so we're gonna plot on and fix this one. <laughs> yeah, no, also TikToking. Thank you all. So we're gonna pop open. Uh, where does this one live again? The controller manager. So let's talk about the responsibilities of the control plane components here. We have the kubelet, which is started as a systemd service and is responsible for sending messages to the container runtime interface to start all of the containers that we need. We have the API server, which is essential uh, in a CRUD interface in front of our etcd backing store, which stores all of the events and requests, etc., that come into our cluster. We have the scheduler, which is broken, which has some responsibilities we may talk about if we fix it. And we have the controller manager, which is a super controller of controllers of controllers. And did you know you can disable any of the controllers within the controller manager through the configuration. So if we pop this open, you'll see we also have another pod configuration, which is running the controller manager. And it takes a parameter down here called controllers. Now star means just run all of the default controllers. We can add on a couple of extra ones like the bootstrap signer and the token cleaner, but you can also remove them. And in fact, you have this weird syntax where you can do dash replica set and dash namespace. This disables the controllers that monitor the namespace and replica set custom resource, not custom resource, <laughs> replica set and namespace resources and handle any of the configuration and uh, reconciliation that has to happen behind the scene. <clears throat> so we can remove that, which is going to bring back our namespace and our replica set controller. And in fact, I might leave the namespace button in because it's a nice visual way for me to create a namespace and you'll see that nothing actually happens. So we'll save that. We'll run PS and maybe I'll get lucky to catch this one. 
Right, so we have no controller manager right now. So the Kubelet has detected that change. It has removed the old process. And there we go, third time lucky. The Kubelet has started a new Kube controller manager with the controllers that we now requested. And in fact, that should be enough that if we give this a few moments, I'm hoping we may say a pod created. Ta-da, there we go. One more problem solved. This is a very broken cluster, I've got to say. So we have a pending thing here, which is probably not very good and something else that we're going to have to debug. Oh, I bet I know what it is, so I am. It's the scheduler, right? It is. Good catch. <laughs> uh, so Russ is asking, so what was the clue in the describe? Was there a clue in the describe? There wasn't a clue in the describe. I said there was no. I said there was yeah. Nothing, I think there was yeah. There was nothing in the describe. Uh, but I think if we would have done uh, the PS aux on the controller, then probably you might have uh, seen the uh, the uh, admissions over there, like the hyphen uh, minus namespace or hyphen namespace over there, uh, or, and the hyphen replica set over there, and you could have got to this particular point, which uh, the editing of the controller YAML file. Yeah. Uh, disabling controllers through the, the controller manager configuration is really hard um, to pick up on. There's not really any error messages. There's nothing really, the system just appears to function completely normal. And because it is, it's just not reacting to that change. So change. Yeah, you really, you just have to um, get familiar with the static pod manifest, know what to expect. And there, there are a few red headings, which I'll, you know, we can point out one of them. Um, you, you know, there's stuff in here that looks weird that rarely is weird. You know, so remember in the bind address, we want that to run on 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 or maybe the local IPv4 address. Understanding which authorization modes are defined by default. You know, you're going to see some insecure port configurations, not in this one, but in the, maybe the controller, no, maybe the cube. Oh, in fact, yeah, you can see a port zero here. So there's just some of these things that you pick up over time and you think, okay, that looks weird, but I know it's completely normal. And I hope my dog is not deafening you all. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, so we do have a scheduler bug. Uh, so I'm, I'm on purposely not going to fix the scheduler. And I'll show you what the problem is. Um, it's trying to run scheduler 124. There is no Kubernetes 124 yet. So it's just not going to work. However, um, to demonstrate what the responsibilities of the scheduler are, they're almost all in void. The scheduler really doesn't do anything. It, it listens for pods being created, and it adds one field to the spec, which is the node that should run on. Now, it has some um, abilities to understand what's running on the nodes, what constraints need to be applied. So, I mean, it is important, and you should never bypass the scheduler. But if you really need to, you can. So we're just going to modify our cluster deployment. I'm going to jump down to our spec here. Add an old name. To, yeah. <laughs> You've done this before, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to copy this. So if we save this, you'll see that our cluster thing has now been scheduled. So the scheduler is important. It does work out the best place to run, especially with tent tolerations, constraints, all of these things. But sometimes it's also important to know that you can break the glass when things go really, really wrong and schedule that workload that you need to as quickly as possible. Uh, one thing that I forgot to show is we can create a namespace via the API server. Oh, it does show up there. Damn it. Never mind. Forget I showed you that. So <laughs> I did disable the namespace controller, um, but I'm not sure what happened there. I didn't expect that to happen. OK, so we have our application. So let's see if it works. Thinking about it. Uh, it's not going to work. OK. I think we have a networking problem. <laughs> so someone was right in the, D in the DNS stuff, right? <laughs> All right. So this 
uh, I think it's important to understand um, what Teleport is doing right now so you can understand what the actual problem domain is, the real cluster. So Clustered is exposed as a node port service. Teleport is trying to redirect to that node port service. The node port service not working will tell us that we have an ingress problem to our cluster. So I will give the chat 30 seconds. What do we look at next to debug an ingress networking problem coming into our cluster? I'm not going to sing the TikTok song this time. All right, 10 more seconds all. Yes, Russ, you're unbanned. Go for it. <laughs> so network policies. Spot on again there, Russell. Uh, so Kubernetes has a concept of a network policy. And we can see here there's something suspiciously called deny whip. Um, so we can dot o yaml or deny whip. And we'll see that this is actually blocking um, all egress traffic. So while it is naughty, I don't think it's the culprit this time. And I think we've discovered a bit of a red herring. So Russell, feel free to have one more pop. But you were close. So well, I've deleted that and uh, we can jump back over here. And I don't expect this to work, but maybe I'll be surprised. All right. Okay, so it wasn't a network policy. Now, the other thing that is uh, important here is that with network policies and uh, CNI implementations that we have these days, is that the standard Kubernetes networking policies are not always the only network policies within a cluster. Um, Cilium, Calico, they all bring their own adaptations. So in fact, if I run get CNP, which is Cilium network policies, we have this other thing called untitled policy, which we can OYAML And this blocks all ingress and all egress. Again, we don't want this. So untitled, wish I'd given it a smaller name. Sneaky Cilium, you are right, Russell. <laughs> However, this may be enough for our application to work. So this is us with our version one image running on our Kubernetes cluster. So I'm sure this is gonna be really easy, Siam, but we're gonna modify our application I'm going to stop using my K alias. And we're going to pull version 2. And then by magic, it's just going to work. Maybe. Uh, I don't know why it's not updating. <laughs> uh, there we go. And now we have to dance. We have now fixed our broken Kubernetes cluster through various debugging techniques, understanding the control plane, knowing where logs live, uh, and understanding the different implementations of the CNI and CRI. Um, I added one more cheeky break, but didn't restart container D. Uh, which I'm going to show you because I think it's really funny and something that people do on Clustered all the time. So let's pop onto one of our worker nodes and we're going to run a container D config dump. And if we find image aliases. Uh, so if I'd restarted container D, we would have seen that our cluster could not pull the V2 image. And that's because instead of hitting GC, ghcr.io, it would have went to docker.io where it would have failed. Um, this is really handy, the container D meter setup for having pull through caches and keeping things locally, even though your manifest refer to a canonical implementation. Great feature, um, but very easy to trip you up. And uh, I hate everyone that's used it on clustered. So, thanks. 
That's me, Siam. We have Fexer cluster. Awesome. Uh, so I think uh, that was really great. Uh, some of the fixes, some of the concepts that were discussed during the fixes, which would definitely help you to uh, understand uh, the the control plane components, how they behave, where they are located, and how you can play around with different set of configurations and options with respect to the uh, controller manager, scheduler, API server, and uh, so I think that that's really uh, you know uh, insightful, um, David. So thank you for bringing all the broken cluster and explaining the concepts first. So that would have definitely been uh, educational for everybody who has attended live and who will be watching the recording later. So and and yes, if you you know want to watch kind of uh, uh, more debugging things, just like David did uh, today. This is getting done all the times on clustered. So this is this is what actually happens. Uh, people see and guess what what happens, what not happens, what works, what doesn't work, and they try to fix. Uh, and it's kind of a, you know uh, in one hour we we try to fix something, and it sometimes does get fixed. Sometimes you have to take the hints. So it's okay. Uh, that's because there are some nasty things that uh, people do with the <laughs> with the clusters. So so that that keeps on happening. Uh, but in the end, it's all about learning. So uh, we hope you learned something uh, for, from the Kubernetes perspective, from uh, the certification perspective, and also uh, from the day-to-day -day perspective of your jobs that uh, you might uh, be using in your debugging in, the, in general uh, when you are working with Kubernetes. Uh, with that, I think uh, uh, I'm... Um, so David, who should we give the vouchers? I think Russ has been uh, very active in the chat. So uh, one voucher goes to Russ. And uh, even uh, Freezebo is was active in the chat. So another one goes to Freezebo. Looks good. Yeah. OK, okay. so I'll just before we finish, add that this stuff is, is really hard. Uh, you know, it's only through um, sharing our knowledge and experimenting and breaking things intentionally. Chaos engineering is a really important part of adopting cloud native and Kubernetes. Um, it's really it's best that you learn how to fix these situations and all the fires that can happen before they hit you in real life production. So, you know, get creative, start breaking stuff, and best of luck. Okay, so Russ is saying he doesn't want to go uh, for the certifications. Then um, another person who commented was. Uh, AJ five zero five hundred. I really don't know who you are. So, <laughs> AJ zero five hundred. If you are in the stream, uh, then please reach me out uh, on Twitter uh, so that you know uh, I can hand you over the voucher and free spo as well. Please reach me out. I'll give you the voucher, which is a fifty percent discount coupon on the certification exams. So uh, with that, I think uh, thank you all for tuning in uh, to the Search Magic Show on Cloud Native TV. Do not forget to click uh, the follow button uh, because that is important. And there are a lot of shows that keeps on going on. And even tomorrow, there's a Spotlight Live with uh, GRPC. Uh, so do not miss that. And it keeps on happening all week, interesting shows. Uh, so make sure you follow that and uh, hope you learned something new today. So thank you so much, everyone, and uh, goodbye. Thanks, all.